Someone recently dropped off this 47 inch TV in my driveway and told me that none of the HDMI ports work. And this is going to be a great candidate to show you how using heat can get your TV working again. But how can heat fix a broken TV? Doesn't that sound crazy? Well, what's also crazy is that heat is what most likely caused the issue in the first place. See, the problem lies deep below a certain type of chip. Somewhere under here, there is a super tiny crack that is preventing an electrical connection. So as I work on this, I'll explore what heat is doing, why you need the right amount of heat, why you need a special ingredient in the process, as well as the methods people use to address this type of failure. So let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is confirm that all of the HDMI ports have quit working. And with my Apple TV hooked up, they all show no signal. Next, I need to take a look inside. Everything in here looks normal, but I'm going to guess that the problem is with the CPU on the main board, which is under this brown heatsink. This chip can be a common culprit for HDMI ports not working or other issues like the TV not turning on, especially for older LG TVs. After removing the plastic clips on the heatsink, I can get to the CPU. This type of chip is called a ball grid array or a BGA chip. The solder connections are underneath the chip, and even looking up real close, it's extremely unlikely that I'm going to see which solder point is the culprit. Here's an example of another BGA chip similar to the one that's on the main board. Chips like these could have hundreds of solder points. A problem a BGA chip can have is that one or more of these solder connections can develop a crack. Here's a thermal image of a heatsink while the TV's running. A likely explanation of the problem is that Due to heat, there's some thermal expansion and those solder points get stress on them. And maybe with some poor original manufacturing, when there are enough heating and cooling cycles, a crack can develop. And what you end up with is that none of your HDMI ports work on your TV. Okay, so if heat is part of the problem, how is it part of the solution? The answer is to get the chip so hot that underneath the solder melts and makes that metallic bond again between the board and the chip. This is what people call reflowing a chip. Maybe you've read or seen videos of people who have put their circuit board in the oven, or maybe they've used a different heat source, and then they see the initial problem go away. People have tried this on their Xboxes or their failed graphics cards and so forth. But because there was a crack to begin with, there's a problem of oxidation that you need to be concerned about that heat by itself won't deal with. Let me show you what I mean. Here is one of my soldering iron tips that is damaged and oxidized. The oxidized surface on the metal prevents it from behaving like you would expect. Notice how the tip is hot enough to melt the solder, but none of it sticks to the iron itself. Now, whether you use an oven or another heat source to heat the chip and get it above the melting point of the solder, if there is oxidation on either side of that tiny crack, when you heat it up, that oxidation may prevent a metallic bond from forming. Compare that to this other soldering tip that isn't oxidized. Notice how the solder behaves very differently and you can see it stick to the iron. So perhaps a question is then, why could putting your board in the oven or using a different heat source work if there is oxidation? Well, it's probably because when the solder solidifies, there's enough physical pressure to make that electrical connection. But there's no knowing how long this pressure will keep that connection. So what you need is something that will deal with the oxidation so that the solder will bond with the other surface. And that special ingredient is called flux. One of flux's jobs is to dissolve the oxidation so that you can get a good solder joint. Now the best way for me to fix this CPU is to remove it from the board, remove all of the old solder and reattach it with fresh solder. That seems like way too much work. The second best way to do it is to use a reflow machine in conjunction with a bottom heater. I don't have either one of those, so let's explore doing a jerry-rig solution with heat sources that I already have. A hair dryer, a heat gun, and a light bulb. Some people might ask, can a hair dryer even get hot enough? Well, let's see if that's true. With my watt meter, I can measure that the hair dryer at full power draws about 1400 watts. And in case you're curious, I've linked to all the tools you see in this video down below. Another tool I have is a FLIR thermal camera that connects to my phone. Here I'm trying to melt a piece of non-leaded solder and you can see at its maximum it doesn't get hot enough. It really needs to get upwards of 360 degrees Fahrenheit or 180 degrees Celsius before you might consider using this on a chip. 
so no matter what people tell you, a hairdryer will not melt solder. Now the heat gun, on the other hand, actually uses less power, about a thousand watts, but it can get much hotter than the hairdryer. To demonstrate how hot it can get, I have a junk board here with a BGA chip on it about the same size as the one on the TV board. The heat gun has no problem getting up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit or about 260 degrees Celsius. This is well past the melting point of the solder and then it's easy to remove the chip. So yes, a heat gun can get the chip hot enough. Though it isn't a precision heat source for reflowing a chip, I'll plan to use it on this TV to show you how an inexpensive and available tool like this can be used. I also mentioned that I don't have a proper bottom heater, one that you might normally use when reflowing a chip. So I'm going to get real jerry rig here and use a 60 watt light bulb. A bottom heater is used to help reduce thermal shock to the board while heating it from above at much higher temperatures. Here my light bulb heat is warming up the board under the chip to about 70 degrees Celsius and I'm happy with that. Before I start the reflow, I'm going to put down some captain tape around the chip to prevent any of the nearby components from moving in the flow of air. So I'm all set to start. I have my bottom and top heat sources figured out. I have flux and have my thermal imaging to give me a clue how hot things are getting. I also have the zoomed in view so I can watch what is happening under the chip. The first thing I'm going to do in the process is to warm up the board underneath with my light bulb preheater for about a minute or two until the top side gets around 40 degrees Celsius. While that's heating up, I wanted to mention that I put together a free resource that includes some of my best tips on how to diagnose a broken LCD TV without taking anything apart. It's amazing how much you can learn about a TV's problems mainly by the symptoms. At the end of the video, I'll explain how you can get that if you're interested. Now that the temperature is up to 40 degrees Celsius on the top, I'm going to slowly warm up the chip from above to try to get it up to about 130 degrees Celsius before I apply the flux. Now that it's reached 130 degrees Celsius, I'm adding the flux to each side of the chip. Now 130 isn't a magical number, but I want it to stay below the melting point of the solder yet make it warm enough to try to minimize the amount of time the flux is heated so it doesn't burn off. I'm back to heating up the chip, slowly lowering my arm down and trying to keep the heat even across the chip. My goal is to raise the temperature and when I see about 200 degrees Celsius, that's when I'll back off the heat. I'm picking 200 degrees because that's the melting point I've read about online for this chip. Also, the chip is probably getting warmer than that because I pointed my sensor slightly off to the side of the chip. The metal surface on top of the chip is making it hard to get a true thermal reading. The flux is hopefully making its way through the underside of that chip and eating away at any oxidation. But the reality is, is that I have no idea if that's really happening. I would need an x-ray machine at like a thousand times magnification to see if that crack disappeared. Instead, my best tool here is the thermal camera that lets me know how hot things are getting. I bought one of these myself years ago and it's been super helpful. And even though I already have one, FLIR recently sent me an upgraded version with better sensitivity and thermal range. These two cameras obviously help me see what the temperatures are so I get the chip just hot enough and not too hot to cause problems. Now, this is definitely a jerry-rig solution. And though I feel pretty confident, unless that flux gets to the right spot and the solder connections melt and cool evenly, I don't really know how long this solution is going to be good for. But the great thing is, is if the problem comes back later on, I can always do this again. So after about four minutes of heating from above, I see the 200 degrees Celsius that I was looking for and checking my view from underneath the chip, that all looks good. So I'm slowly backing away on the heat and watch what happens all of those solder connections solidify. After trying to keep a steady cool down rate, next I'll let the board sit and cool down on its own to room temperature. Then I'll remove the thermal resistant tape and clean off the flux residue. I use isopropyl alcohol and if I were more ambitious, I'd use my ultrasonic cleaner to clean under the chip, but that takes a little bit more work to get set up and using IPA is just fine. I'm reseating the thermal pad on the chip and installing the heatsink, and it's time to test out the HDMI ports. As you can see, the TV turns on, so at least I didn't make the problem worse. But when I test the first HDMI port, I get sound and I get video. So this operation has been a success. When I test the other HDMI ports, they are now working too. If you're interested in that resource I mentioned earlier, 
how to diagnose an LCD TV without taking anything apart? Well, I created a free PDF that you can download with all my favorite tips and tricks so that you can diagnose a TV quickly. Maybe you have one that isn't working, or maybe you're curious if you should pick one up that someone's getting rid of. If so, you definitely want to check this out. Go to the link below or go to my website, frugalrepair.com, and click under free resources. If you like these kind of videos, check out my repair playlist up here. Give me a thumbs up down here. And if you want to see what goes on behind the scenes in between video releases, make sure to follow me on Instagram. Post any questions, comments below. Thanks for watching.